Hello, our historians. So welcome to our first flipped lecture where we're going to start creating the context behind our first unit on prehistoric art. So the entire purpose of this lecture is to kind of start setting up the spice. All right, so we're actually working backwards with Ida right now. So we're looking at, okay, these are the things that we know were going on in the context. So how does what we know about the context influence the way that the art looks and the way that it is made and where it is made? So that's where we're going to start from here. So just take a second to look at this picture, all right? And if I asked you to observe this picture, I'm asking you just to look at it. Um, you obviously don't know the context behind it. You don't really know exactly what was going on. But just from observing it, you can probably make some inferences. All right? And inferences are conclusions that you come to just based on what you are seeing or hearing. So if you look at this, you might infer that Gretchen was having a bad day because she has tears in her eyes. Or maybe she really loves animals because she is crying because she's so happy she gets to hold it. Or you may be inferring that Gretchen is very sweet or she's not or that you really wanted, she really wanted to see this little duckling, she did, and in fact she's upset because we kept trying to take it away from her. She was loving it too much, actually. Like there was, we had to make sure that she didn't actually kill this little duckling, all right? So just from observation, all right, we can observe certain things about what was going on and then kind of draw inferences from that, all right? So for this very first unit, we need to look at two very important terms, and those are anthropology and archaeology. So anthropology is the study of humans, basically from the past to the present. And we do this in a variety of different ways, looking at biology, sociology, psychology. Um, it's really just the study of people and human beings and how they develop and what they do. Then there is archaeology, which is where you study humans and particularly their history through what they have left behind in the past. So in this particular unit, we are really working as art historians hand in hand with anthropology because we are studying humans through the artistic artifacts and architectural artifacts that they have left behind. So archaeology in terms of art history, they really do go together very closely, particularly in this particular unit. And the reason why is in the prehistoric time period, prehistory means not that there wasn't history going on, there was, but it's the fact that there wasn't any writing that exists to tell us exactly what was happening. We have no confirmation of what these people were actually thinking or actually doing. So or all we can really do is look at what we see, what they left behind, so that's your archaeology, and use that to help anthropologists study these humans. So in this particular case, history really does kind of help these other fields, and especially art history, to kind of see what humans were doing and why, and propose theories about what this art actually means. Now, all we can do is observe the art and architecture they left behind. So pretty much everything we're going to be talking about is based on inferences and what we have seen happening in various places all over the world. So archaeology has shown us by looking at these artifacts of the art that's been left behind and the architecture that's been left behind, it has shown us that early humans, no matter where they were in the world, were very, very similar in this time of prehistory. And how can we infer that? Well, we can infer that by observing the art that they left behind. So all of this has led us to come up with some pretty solid theories about what life was like for human beings before they actually were writing down their history and telling us and leaving records of what they were actually doing. So these theories help us to kind of figure out, okay, what was this art for? What was its purpose? Who was it made for? Who was it made by? And we do that by observing what they left behind, which is archaeology, and figuring out what human life was like based on what they left us, which is anthropology. So all of these A's, art history, archaeology, and anthropology, you kind of all go together. You kind of get to become Indiana Jones right off the bat in this very first unit. So here is what we know, all right, about early human history, all right? To them, everything was about survival, all right? We have the context of what we know was going on during this time in history as far as 
climate goes as far as what humans were doing. So, for example, we know that they switched from hunting and gathering to farming. And because of that, we can infer that since they had this type of lifestyle, that's going to influence their practices. It's going to influence their belief systems, so their religious systems, all of these things. We don't have any actual proof of what the function of these works of art were for. But we can kind of infer that based on what we know about the context at the time and by observing these works of art. Okay, so it is very important to keep in mind that one of the biggest things we focus on for prehistoric art is looking at the function of art. We really want to know what were these works of art for? What was their purpose? Because we know they're not really decorative. We've kind of figured that out. But what were these made for? Why would these early human beings decide to take the time and the effort to make these works of art and architecture? What was it for? Who was it for? Why would it even be created? So for prehistoric art, it really is important for us to look at what function did these works of art and architecture serve during this time period? So here's what we know. All right, let's work on establishing this context, all right, and looking at the spice factors during this time. And it might be a really good idea for you in your notes to write out spice and see what information from this lecture you can fit into it. That is that contextual information that gives us the A, the why these works of art look the way they do, why they were created, why they are where they were found. So in terms of prehistory, what's pretty incredible about this is 95% of any time humans have existed was before humans could write. Only 5% of history has been since humans settled in civilizations and were able to actually settle down and write and farm. That is a massive amount of history, but it generally gets left out because people don't consider it important history since we don't know for sure, since they didn't leave writing. What we do know is there are some distinct time periods in prehistoric art that show that there were some major influences and some major events going on that impacted the way the art is going to look. So first we have Paleolithic, which is the Old Stone Age. Then we're going to have Mesolithic, which is in the middle, which we don't really talk about much. And then there is Neolithic, which is the New Stone Age, where we start using tools, we just use them in different ways. And that's primarily because in the Neolithic time, we decide to start farming. And what is pretty incredible about this is even though we weren't writing yet, human beings were creating art long before they could write. And there were some serious reasons as to why they would do that. You know about people during this time, right? Number one, we know that people during this time were nomadic. That is an extremely important part in Paleolithic art that humans were hunter-gatherers. They did not stay in one place very long. They followed where the food went, and that took them all over the world as we moved out of Africa. The very first oldest works of human art are found in Africa, which helps to tell us, okay, well, then that's probably where human existence started. As people moved out of Africa because of climate change, so you've got a couple things that happen, that you enter this ice age, and when the Ice Age happens, all of a sudden, the water gets pulled into these glaciers and into these ice structures. And as it goes into the ice, the water levels go down. So that means that as the water turns into ice, there's more land available. And there's these land bridges available that don't exist anymore because of climate change. And people were able to cross these land bridges and spread out all over the world. But the crazy part is, no matter where they settled, they were able to still have similarities in what they created in terms of art and how they created their art. Now, there will be some differences based on what's available. So, for example, in the Americas, a lot of the art is made out of animal bone and animal skin and terracotta clay. Whereas on the other side of the world, you're going to see different materials be used based on what they had available. So these migrations, all right, as people migrate out of Africa and migrate across the world, we're going to see that what the artworks are made of, so the form of them, are going to be shaped by what they had available in their environments. But what is kind of crazy is that the content, no matter where they were in the world, strongly revolves during the Paleolithic period around animals. 
there are some scary commonalities of things that we have seen in the Americas and things we have seen in Australia and in Europe of people who never would have met each other, who still focus their art very heavily on the importance of animals, who were their basis for survival. So what we're going to see is that no matter where humans migrated to, we see some scary similarities happening in terms of what their art looked like, even if not necessarily what it was made of. And that definitely shows us that their focus was on survival, no matter where they were. So that Paleolithic hunter-gatherer society, that way of, of living where they moved around and they migrated and they only had what they needed. There wasn't a whole lot of time or hands to carry stuff that was unnecessary. You needed stuff that was light and small and portable and just basically all about surviving. We're not going to see during Paleolithic time any big, large-scale architecture because why would you? You're not going to be settling there or coming back to it. You want stuff that is portable and that can go with you. So, for example, Paleolithic sculptures are usually very small, and it wasn't so much necessarily about individuals. So the individual themselves doesn't really matter. It's what you can bring to the group. Everybody, including women, were expected to pull their weight because you're all in this together to survive. So you don't see a lot of individualization, like individual faces. It's more the idea of what a person is or should do that is represented in their art. So what common things do we see in Paleolithic art all over the world? Well, when it's Paleolithic, so before we start farming, Paleolithic is about being hunter-gatherers. The major content focus is almost always animals because you need them to survive. They are what is keeping you alive. Humans are usually not very important. Um, they're usually not very elaborate because they don't matter as much. And if a human is shown in Paleolithic time, it's usually a woman because women were very important. Women were very cyclical, right? So women have cycles that they go through and they're actually able to give birth and they're able to have cycles kind of like the planets and the sun and the moon do. So women were actually considered kind of representative of that. Plus women had the ability to give life. That was an extremely important thing. Now, during this time, it wasn't about having lots of babies because you don't want those in a hunter-gatherer society where you're moving around a lot. It's just the fact that women kind of represented, my light went off, what light, life is like. Like it's very cyclical, like life and death and the cycle of life and renewal and regrowth of plants and renewal of animals. We also know that most, in fact, 100% of Paleolithic art is made of natural materials, things that are available already. So for example, natural pigments made of just materials on the ground, animal bone, uh, stone that they find laying around that they shape. They don't really go out of their way to make synthetic materials. It's based on what they can find. And again, humans don't have a whole lot of detail, but animals will be shown in a lot of detail. So for example, sometimes we'll see animals in what's called composite view or twisted perspective where you can see more sides. So like for example, maybe the side of a bull but the body of the bull so you can see more of it because they are much more important. So Paleolithic people were very, very practical, right? They're just basing their lives on making sure they have access to food, which is hunting and gathering and making sure that they had access to these animals. So most of what we believe, what we're inferring from observing how detailed the animals are in these work, works of art, is that they were intended to help with food production. So like plants and animals. What we also know is that human beings like stability. We do not like to feel like we're out of control and we have no control over things. So the more we can do to get control in a world where we don't have one helps us. So what we know is that these early people seem to understand stable things on a macro, large scale, and micro level. So for example, they knew that there were predictable forces like stars, planets, moon, the way that they moved, they were able to use those to kind of track different seasons and the movement of animals and when it was going to get cold. But they also knew that there were microcosmic forces. So for example, 
if you had a really tough material like here on earth like jade or gray walk that the more important something is and it's made out of harder material then the more difficult it was to make so it shows its importance so experience like trying to get some stable control by understanding these things so again paleolithic art was really all about survival making sure that species were continuing especially animals um, and that food was available they need to know what is constant and predictable so with females you'll often see like their exaggerated features like their reproductive organs because women are cyclical so this was a way to kind of tr keep track of cycles and the fact that everything moves in a pattern now early people we know believed in something called animism all right and animism is the earliest known religious practice and it's a basic belief that everything is animated so these early people kind of assumed that everything was like them that it had this spirit within them and feelings within them and they believe that every inanimate object including plants and trees and even animals which aren't inanimate but you get it all had a spirit that could be communicated with and controlled so for example right here noah my son used to take chase this little stuffed dog with him everywhere because he believed that Chase, if he got left at home, would be lonely or sad. And if I wanted to put Noah in timeout, I would put Chase in timeout because he knew that it made him sad, so it must be making Chase sad. So that's animism at its basic form, this idea of believing that everything is animated with a spirit that you could communicate with or even control. So what we see in these early artworks is something called um, shamanism which kind of relates to that animism idea that there were shamans who had the ability in these cultures to communicate with these different spirits especially animal spirits and the powers of nature so that you could in some way kind of control what these animals were doing so kind of getting in connection with the spirit world so for example if you painted a lot of these animals maybe that meant that the more you paint them the more there will be maybe they will appear and you can connect with those spirits or if you painted them maybe they would come to you or if you created it maybe it put you in contact with that animal spirit or if you showed a ritual of humans killing a particular animal then maybe that meant that they would have control over this or maybe if you wore the skull of a particular animal then you could become one with it and communicate with it we also know that in early paleolithic art we see a great deal of what's called stylization and stylization means you deliberately make something look not realistic like you you know you're doing it on purpose you're like okay i know this is not how people actually look right so for example with women they would cover up their faces on purpose because the faces of the people don't actually matter but what is important is the function of the woman so to emphasize that obviously the reproductive organs are overemphasized and stylized to show that that was the important part of the meaning okay so i think it's very important to at least take a moment to point out that with um, paleolithic societies there really is this major emphasis on females and I really can't point this out enough because really from this point on in history that is going to go away like there is no point in history where females were more revered and honored than they were before we switched to farming because again women had this ability to give and bring life and just like the universe and the stars went through cycles and movements women also had cycles that were very predictable and kind of aligned and in tune with the planet so again it wasn't so much about in a nomadic society that you wanted to have lots of babies um it was the fact that because of their ability to reproduce they too were cyclical and predictable even though you know today it's like women are very unpredictable no they were actually much more predictable and much more stable and therefore we see all over the world in all different cultures no matter where in paleolithic cultures we see females are of importance and usually with exaggerated features that today would not be considered as beautiful but back then because they had to do with reproduction and their ability to reproduce made them very honored and revered 
So this entire lecture was the context of the Paleolithic era, which is in prehistory, there are two parts. There's Paleolithic and Neolithic that we are going to look at. And again, even though we don't have writing, we can use the context that we know to kind of evaluate and think about what were these works of art for? What were they made of? Sorry, had somebody come to the door. The biggest point I was trying to make, sorry, as I got cut off, was that we don't know 100% what was going on in the heads of these people who created these works of art, but because we know the context in which they were created in, we can kind of start to infer what their meaning was or what they were for. And in turn, the artwork that they left behind and architecture can help us infer what their lifestyle was like. So for example, with a big emphasis on females and animals. So a big change is going to happen in prehistoric art once we shift to farming, because when we move to farming, we become more settled and we start becoming more in charge of our own destiny as we grow our own food. Humans are going to become more important. Architecture is going to develop and become more large scale. But that we will look at at a later time.